Well, the Inter International Energy Agency is an international organization. It's headquartered in Paris, and it's, it's part of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development's family of, of, of uh, organizations. But at the IEA, I was, in, I was basically the chief operating officer for the agency. I was the one that made sure that things got done uh, on time and that they were at a sufficient quality uh, to uh, um, present to member, member countries. And believe me, it's getting harder and harder to square the circle of how we're going to uh, limit global warming to less than one and a half degrees centigrade, which is the agreed target uh, with existing technologies. So that's why I'm particularly interested in the fusion technology. And when I found out about, about uh, LPP and the work they're doing and realized that it was a, a different approach to fusion, I thought, yeah, that's something I should support because the, the consensus uh, approach to fusion, the tokamak, uh, hasn't delivered. When I was at the IEA, probably, this was probably about 2005 or six. Oh no, I'm sorry, uh, 10 or 12. Um, the, uh, we, we had a report from the technology cooperation program on fusion. And in great detail, the, the different working groups, uh, we, we found out everything they're doing. And one, I was impressed with, with uh, how hard they were working. But also, I was impressed with how difficult the challenge was that they had taken on. And uh, but at that time, they said, "Yeah, we're really we're really made progress. We know that ten years ago we said that it would be thirty years. Well, it's we still think it's going to be thirty years, but this time we're really really confident that it will only be thirty right. years. Well, and here we are, maybe uh, ten twelve years later, <laughs> and I read something just the other day." About 30 years is what it'll take before we have uh, fusion reactors. And the other thing that, that uh, troubles me is these are such high tech. They're so complicated. They will be very hard to uh, rely on. They, they ju I just can't see them uh, providing continuous power like a generator needs to, needs to uh, provide. So, and I know there are other approaches. There's the laser approach and so on. Uh, I think the laser approach is probably better than the tokamak, but still, how do you get those lasers to fire continuously at the power they need and so on? So, uh, so I've been frustrated that, that somebody hasn't come up with a better way, but I do have a technical education. I have a, a PhD in statistics. Uh, I went to Harvey Mudd College, uh, majored in mathematics. So I can, Pretty well understand, but I don't obviously I don't know the details on on the physics of plasma physics and so on. But I I decided that I thought that uh, it was worth it to bet uh, uh, on on your technology in hopes that it would uh, uh, pan out. I mean, the history is certainly um, rife with with you know garage inventors who created whole industries, Steve Jobs and so on, the Wright brothers. So, uh, you know, maybe in the 21st century, century, it'll be your turn, Eric. And if I can help that with a small amount of money, I'm happy to do it. You don't have the problem with the neutrons that the tokamaks have, uh, you know, and, and the hydrogen boron fuel does not produce new neutrons when it fuses. So that's, that's huge because the neutrons is, is what really makes uh, me nervous about the tokamaks because the neutrons go everywhere. They go into the walls of all the containment vessels and so on. And a lot of the work that was being done in this technical uh, cooperation program that I talked about uh, was on how do you keep the walls from getting brittle because the neutrons make them make the metal more brittle. And that to me, it's not that it would be a, con a catastrophe like uh, Three Mile Island or something like that, but it means that the, the the generator will break and it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar generator. And then you have to replace the whole thing. That's crazy. So the lack of the neutrons is, is very important for me, but also your notion that, that you can go straight to the production of electricity is huge. Uh, I'm not exactly sure I understand how you do that, but uh, uh, that is, uh, 
you don't need a, the intermediate step that you have in fusion, which is from the heat source to a steam generator, basically in, in traditional nuclear power. Uh, so that's, and, and the size. And if you don't need a, a, a lot of uh, huge power uh, uh, lines coming in, you don't need, you can just produce power for the, for the consumers in the local area. That's that's huge. I mean, you you mentioned in some of your your uh, um, literatures about um, um, the danger to the grid from renewables because or, or that that the grid requires the renew the, the the renewables require the grid to be more flexible, which is true. Uh, you can get that flexibility, but it means you have to have connections between many different nodes. And that uh, the more connections you have, the more difficult it becomes to manage, the easier it is for it to, to, to have a problem. And, uh, but if, if, you're, if you're only providing your local area with your generator, and it's a small generator, the, uh, you, you can have greater continuity. It's almost like having a, a, a fossil fuel generator in, in your garage uh, you know, for local power outages. But if you can uh, power a city, with one generator and, and you don't have to have connections to me that that makes a great deal of sense for for the robustness of the power supply to people, the continuity of service and the quality of life. 